everyone. Welcome back to The Dark Side. I'm your host, Sherry. It takes a lot these days to give me the heebie-jeebies. I've just kind of grown immune to getting chills like I used to since I got so much true crime in my noggin 24-7. Well, this is a case that does it for me. A woman named Missy Beavers was murdered, and we have her killer on video, but solving this mystery will be anything but easy. This is a super chilling case, and we know Missy's final moments were absolutely terrifying. As always, my sources are listed in the description area. This is episode 103, The Case of Missy Beavers. This story took place in 2016. There was the Flint water crisis, which President Obama declared a state of emergency. That water crisis is still ongoing today, but the levels have gotten better. Donald Trump was elected president. We had the Pulse nightclub shooting in Orlando. The world mourned the deaths of David Bowie, Prince, Alan Rickman, and Muhammad Ali. And lastly, some good news. Giant panda bears were declared no longer endangered. In the very early morning hours on April 18th, 2016, it is a very dark, rainy morning in Midlothian, Texas. It was a hard, heavy rain, the kind that makes you want to stay in bed. But for Camp Gladiator students, they have a fitness class beginning at 5 o'clock a.m. Camp Gladiator is a fitness boot camp for adults that is this high-intensity workout program. Their energetic fitness instructor is 45-year-old Missy Beavers, and she doesn't care that it's 5 a.m. or that it's raining. She's got a class to teach and is determined to help these folks reach their goal. The night before the class, she posted on Facebook, No excuses. You are gladiators. If it's raining, we're still training. See, Missy usually did the fitness class outside of Creekside Church of Christ in Midlothian, Texas, but since it would be raining tomorrow morning, she assures students class will be held as usual, but they will meet inside the church in one of the classrooms. She also reminds them that if they have been using the same weights for the past two weeks, it is now time to level up. See you tomorrow. Around 5 o'clock a.m. in the pouring down rain, the fitness class students are pulling into the church one at a time. They see their instructor Missy's car outside since she usually arrives 30 minutes earlier to set up. They make their way inside the church and down the hall and into the room where the class would be held. Instead of Missy greeting them like she always does, they instead are horrified to see the body of Missy laying on the floor. She had been bludgeoned to death. Missy Beaver's real name is Terry, but she always went by Missy. I thought because of the spelling, her last name would be pronounced Bevers, but all the press conferences I watched that were held by police and interviews with friends all pronounced it Beavers. Missy was born August 9, 1970 in Graham, Texas. She was the middle child in between two brothers. She graduated high school in 1988 and then went off to college at Tarleton University where she received her bachelor's degree in 1995. In 1998, she married her husband, Brad Beavers. Missy went back to school to work on her teaching certificate and worked as an assistant special education teacher until her first child was born in 2001, a daughter named Hannah. At this point, Missy decides she wants to be a stay-at-home mom and care for her daughter full-time. In 2003, they had a second daughter, Allie, and in 2007, they welcomed their third and final child, a daughter named Sarah. According to Missy's family, quote, In the last several years, Missy's newest passion became fitness. She first worked on herself, and when she became more physically fit than she had ever been, she decided to help transform other people's lives through fitness. She once again became a teacher. Missy was more than just a a camp gladiator instructor trying to help you become more physically fit. She wanted her campers to also be mentally, emotionally, and spiritually fit. Missy loved God, her husband, her girls, her family, her friends, and everyone she came in contact with. In 2016, at the time of this story, Missy is a fitness instructor for Camp Gladiator. Upon looking at their website, 
Camp Gladiator has independent trainers that host classes at various public spots. It's not just high intensity workouts, but also food coaching and meal plans. Prices range between $55 to $109 per month. This also gives you access to message your coach at any time if you need motivation or someone to talk to. By the way, I sound like I'm promoting an ad for Camp Gladiator, but I'm not sponsored by them. I believe Camp Gladiator may be exclusive to Texas only, but it couldn't really find much about that on their website. The morning of April 18th, 2016, Missy leaves her home in Red Oak, Texas, and heads to the Creekside Church of Christ in Midlothian, Texas, on Highway 287. This is about 30 minutes outside of Dallas. This is an average church. It's not some super fancy mega church. It has a congregation area and multiple rooms for the nursery and Sunday school. It's on a highway, and there are some businesses in the area, but everything is closed. It's a very quiet morning, except for the heavy rain. Occasionally, you see a car pass down the highway, but that's it. Missy arrives at the church at 418 a.m. She parked her car near the front door and was taking equipment from the car to the room where she was holding class. It's dark and pouring down raining. She had to make multiple trips, and she just wants to get her equipment inside as quickly as possible. Remember, she told her students that tomorrow's class would be held indoors. Missy goes inside the room where she is preparing for her class, which is starting in just 30 minutes. But between 4.30 and 5 o'clock a.m., Missy was met with brutal violence. Students begin arriving through the front door that Missy had left unlocked for them. These are adults who are taking this fitness boot camp and they are carrying their dumbbells, their mats, and water bottles. The first student to arrive makes her way into the room and is shocked to see their beloved instructor, who was always full of energy and life, was attacked and no longer with us. A student calls 911 and police quickly make their way to the church. This is the first murder in seven years that has occurred in Midlothian, Texas. I'm not implying the police are clueless about how to handle this, but they aren't used to dealing with this level of crime. They enter the room and see 45-year-old Missy Beavers on the floor. She has broken glass around her. I don't know if there were windows in this room she was in or where this glass came from. Missy has puncture wounds to her head and chest. At this point, they can tell she was attacked with something, but they don't know what it is just yet. The police contact church administrators and they reveal that they have security cameras, but the outdoor cameras, as usual, are not working. We see that in so many cases. If you have outdoor cameras, check on them occasionally. This could really be a huge part of this case. Now, it could be that the killer disabled the security cameras somehow, but usually the video is uploaded to a cloud. It's not like the 80s and 90s where you can steal the tape out of them. So we won't know what kind of car this person drives without the parking lot cameras. However, they do have something that will help. Inside the church, there are motion detector cameras that were recording 24-7. The cameras didn't capture Missy in the room. They only showed the hallways. I will link the video in my sources so you can check it out for yourself. We see on the cameras a person enter the church at 3.50 a.m. Remember, Missy got there at 4.18 a.m. So they had been there for 20 to 30 minutes already. This person is wearing full tactical gear. They have a jacket that reads police in big letters on the back, shin guards, a helmet that covers their full face. They look like a SWAT team member or riot control. You can't tell if it's a man, a woman, black, white, or really anything. Although police have determined that it appears this person is white, I'm not sure how they came to this conclusion. You can't tell if they are heavy set because they are wearing super thick gear. They are walking down the hallways carrying a hammer. This is so strange because the person is casually strolling around like he doesn't have a care in the world. I swear if the video had audio, you'd probably hear him whistling while he's walking, which would make this video more creepy than it already is. He's slowly walking around like he doesn't have a purpose, just swinging his arms At one point, you see him run his finger down the wall as he's walking like we used to do when we were in school. 
He would open a door, peer in, and then he'd go smash glass like the cover of a fire extinguisher or a window. He's just strolling around vandalizing stuff. You see him enter and exit doors. It doesn't look like he's looking for anything in particular, just kind of being nosy, except when he'd take his hammer and break stuff. He's fiddling with things, and police wonder if perhaps this was a robbery and Missy just happened to interrupt it. We don't have anything on video of Missy interacting with her killer. But church administrators confirmed that nothing was stolen. As well, this isn't some megachurch. There's not much to steal. There's Bibles, music stands, and possibly sound equipment, but that's about it. There's no safe or cash kept anywhere. And again, nothing was stolen. Missy had an expensive wedding ring on, and it wasn't stolen. Even Missy's car contained her purse, her iPad, and her cell phone. Those items weren't taken either. He may, he may have been just smashing things to make it look like a burglary. They also found evidence of forced entry into the building. Missy had a key, but the killer made his way in, they believe, with a pry bar or the hammer he was carrying around. We also wonder if perhaps this person knows Missy and saw her Facebook post the night before stating class would be held inside and knew she would be the first one there and this was an opportunity to attack her since she would be alone. Police determined that the tactical gear this killer was wearing was mismatched. We don't know if the code he was wearing with the word police is a legit law enforcement code or if it was something he ordered off of a knockoff website. Everything looks real to me, though. We don't find his fingerprints anywhere since he's wearing gloves. Besides, this is a church. There's fingerprints from hundreds of people and kids everywhere. They believe that this person, based on the video, is between 5'2 and 5'8. Something huge stands out to them in the video, though. It's the way the person walked. According to Ryan Osborne for WFAA, when they walk, the, the left foot points to the left slightly and the right foot points more to the right. This person has a slight limp and the right foot was more dominant. A person's walking pattern is called their gait. That's G-A-I-T. I had to look this up because I had never heard of it. Each person has a different gait. For example, someone who has a hurt knee may drag it a little bit when they walk. Some people hunch over and walk fast. There are several different gates. This person in the church had a very noticeable gait. I don't know the exact term for it except pigeon-toed. When he walked, his feet pointed outward, more so on the right. Police know they're looking for someone with this abnormal walk, but there's always the chance it was done on purpose to throw police off because he knew he was on camera, maybe faking the limp or making his foot go at a weird angle, or they're wearing so much tactical gear it's causing them to walk differently. Again, Midlothian hadn't had a murder in seven years, so people are extremely upset and the community is on edge. Police eventually released the video of the person walking through the church in tactical gear. They comb through all these tips that come pouring in. It seems like for every 1,000 tips you get in cases like these, it, you know, two or three may be credible, but it's still important to submit tips because yours could be that credible one that they need. Assistant Police Chief Kevin Johnson says in a press conference four days after the murder, We believe someone knows who this person is and hasn't come forward. We're committed to finding the person responsible for Missy's death, and we're not going to rest until we do so. He went on to say, We are backing off our statement that the suspect on video was a man. There's a lot of speculation based on the gait and appearance that this person may be a woman. It's a legitimate question right now. We no longer will say the suspect is a man. That doesn't mean I'm saying the suspect is a woman. It's just at this point, we can't rule it out. We don't know yet. I wonder if Missy heard him breaking glass. He wasn't trying to remain quiet. What's chilling to me is Missy may have thought he was a safe person. She saw him wearing police gear. Maybe she said, officer, what's wrong? Why are you here? He may have told her to freeze. I can't imagine the fear watching this man wearing a helmet come after her. She doesn't know who is behind the mask. Not much is known about the attack right now except the person likely used the hammer he was swinging around while walking through the halls. 
Missy had puncture wounds to her head and her chest. I don't know if this person's car was in the parking lot because there were no outdoor cameras working, but if Missy saw a car, she may not have went in, thinking that someone was breaking in, unless the car was hidden behind the church where she couldn't see it at 4 o'clock in the morning. There was a tip that came in that someone saw a dark-colored SUV pulling out of the church at 4.30 a.m., I have read unconfirmed reports that a gun was found near her and that she was shot. However, each time I read this, it was just someone in the comments on Reddit or in a blog post. I can't find any reputable official source that states she was shot. The only reports I can find from the police who were at the scene state that Missy was attacked with a hammer and died from puncture wounds to the head and chest. Police say, yes, there was a gun recovered, but the gun belonged to Missy and it was stashed in her vehicle. Missy was known to carry and she has a legal right to do that. This is Texas and it's much more normal for regular citizens to carry a weapon. I'm wondering if this killer knew Missy carried a gun, which is why they were wearing tactical gear, or they knew Missy and didn't want her to know who they were, so they wore this costume to conceal themselves. There wasn't any real sexually charged motive, I don't think. There's been nothing stating that Missy was sexually assaulted, unless I'm not finding it anywhere. This leads some to believe that the killer may have been a woman. They don't have any suspects at this time. Who would want to hurt this super nice lady that just wants to better people's lives through health and fitness? Missy's husband is obviously one of the first people they want to speak with. However, Brandon had rock-solid alibis. He wasn't even in Texas at the time. He was on a fishing trip in Mississippi. Now, I've read that this wasn't a spur-of-the-moment trip. He did this once a year. He and his buddies meet up to fish in Mississippi. One of Missy's fitness students called him and told him that there was a robbery or something that happened at the church and Missy was no longer with us. However, someone else close to Missy have police taking a closer look. There was video of Missy's husband, Brandon, and his father, Randy, walking into the police station, not for any reason other than just normal procedure. It could have been to collect Missy's things or something like that. But the first thing people noticed was that Missy's father-in-law, Randy, walked exactly like the person in the video. His right foot pointed to the right as he's walking, and they're both around the same height. This is huge. He also has a stocky build. Now, Randy had rock-solid alibis as well. Randy was away in California at the time of her murder. He was vacationing along with his wife. He wasn't anywhere near Texas. But it was a major coincidence that he had this exact distinct gait as the person walking through the hallways that morning. But to make matters worse, just four days after Missy's murder, police receive a call from a local dry cleaners. They said someone dropped off a white shirt to be cleaned and it was covered in blood. The name on the ticket was Missy's father-in-law, Randy Beavers. This sends the media and internet users into a frenzy. Police interview Randy right away to ask about this blood on, on the shirt. He says that it's dog blood. He gives the story that his chihuahua was attacked by this other dog who was bigger. The big dog had gotten the chihuahua by the throat, and when Randy walked in, he saw the chihuahua laying on the floor. He scooped up the dog and took him to the vet, and doing this got blood on his shirt. It is verified that Randy did bring an animal to the vet's office for an emergency appointment, but police still want a look at that blood. So they get a search warrant for the shirt that was dropped off. The blood was tested because if this, is, if this blood is a match to Missy, it's over. But the DNA test results showed that it was canine blood. And sadly, the little dog ended up passing away. So Randy's like, see everyone, I'm telling the truth. This coupled with his alibi that he was in California with his wife, wife at the time, police have ruled him out as a person of interest. Even with both of these men vetted and cleared, the public still believes that they have something to do with it. According to a post by Missy's sister-in-law, the FBI even went to Mississippi and interviewed folks who say, yes, Missy's husband, Brandon, was here. 
They spoke to guys who went on the fishing trip with him. They also have his cell phone data showing he was there. They also checked with American Airlines and confirmed that his dad, Randy, was in California with his wife. Finding Missy's killer is going to be hard. We don't have fingerprints. We don't have any DNA. We have video of the person, but he's got a full helmet on. Without any leads, the police are turning to Missy's personal life to see if maybe there was something there that could help them. They look into her and Brandon's marriage and learn that they did in fact have some issues they were working through. They were having money problems as well as some talks of infidelity. It's not stated officially if the infidelity was on Missy's part or Brandon's part, police won't say. They learned that Missy was extremely active on social media. She's an independent contractor, so she has to do marketing and that kind of thing. No one is going to come to her fitness classes unless she advertises them. We learned Missy had a LinkedIn profile. LinkedIn is a website that is like social media for professionals. You can advertise your work history and education to potential employers. It's a useful website for people who are looking for professional connections. So, Missy had recently told a friend that she received some creepy messages from someone on LinkedIn, which is a really odd platform to receive creepy messages on. Most people would get them on Facebook or Instagram or whatever, but for some reason, Missy gets a weird message on LinkedIn. Police look into this and find there were two recent conversations that had been going on. According to CBS News, one message was someone being creepy and stalkerish that was sent to her just three days before she was killed. The other conversation was between Missy and a man. They had conversations that went back a few months and up until she was killed. The messages were described as flirtatious and familiar. The police could only recover a portion of them because they had been deleted by Missy. But police are more interested in the creepy one she received three days before her death. I don't know what the contents of the message were, but friends say Missy was weirded out. Police were not able to locate this man, but believe he could very well be her killer. The FBI have a forensic podiatrist brought in to assist with the case. Dr. Michael Nirenberg runs a foot clinic, but he is also an on-call doctor for police if they need help in a case and there are feet involved, especially footprints and things of that nature. This definitely qualifies for that because we know her killer has something up with their feet. He studies the video of the killer in the hallway, and then he has one of the officers put on tactical gear and begin walking. Dr. Nirenberg says that all that tactical gear and carrying a hammer affected this person's gait, so we don't know if this person really does have a limp and a foot that points to the right. He also says that you can't determine a person's gender by the way they walk. Dr. Nirenberg says he receives tons of videos from true crime armchair detectives. They would say, look at my neighbor walk. Do you think this is the person who killed Missy? Police have received over a thousand tips in this case, but one name had come up quite a few times and police begin to take a closer look. A man by the name of Bobby Henry. Bobby Henry is a former tactical police officer for the Midlothian Police Department. Bobby had been fired from the police department for sexually assaulting a woman while on duty. Bobby still owned his riot gear, but he says it doesn't fit him anymore. He attended church at Creekside Church of Christ and currently worked as a security guard. And according to True Crime Edition, he even provided security at Missy's funeral. He walked with a limp and lastly, he owned a dark colored SUV similar to the one that was described in a tip as leaving the church that morning at 4.30 a.m. Keep in mind, we don't know if this dark SUV was a credible tip. Police received over a thousand and this was just one of them, but everything seemed to point to maybe Bobby being the killer. However, Bobby was ruled out since he is six foot one inch tall. The killer is between five foot two and five foot eight. He also had an alibi for the night of Missy's murder and he denies he knew her. One thing that came out of this, though, was that Bobby was arrested during a search of his home for containing explicit images of children on his computer and other devices. 
When doing the research for this case, I kept coming across two names. They were popping up everywhere, especially relating to Missy's cell phone records. I won't say them on here because they haven't been made public officially, I think, but I'll just call them by their initials. A.T. is a man who is a Camp Gladiator fitness coach, just like Missy. His wife is C.T. C.T. had foot surgery two years before Missy's murder, and C.T. has a stocky build. Some believe C.T. may have suspected an affair between her husband, A.T., and Missy. C.T. was scrutinized hard by web sleuths. A.T. even wrote on Facebook, It's Trash Day. When my wife left the house to take the kids to school, my neighbor saw a person get out of their parked car and take our bags of trash, throw it in their car, and drive off. In January 2017, the biggest clue to come in the nine months since Missy was murdered, besides the church video, is released to the public. This is something that police have been holding out on. They were hoping they would have someone in custody by now, but they don't. Although the church outdoor cameras weren't working at the time, Two hours before Missy's murder, we have some outdoor cameras that were working close by. It's the very early morning hours of April 18th, about 2 o'clock a.m. There is a sporting goods store right up the street from the church. The police released a still image of a vehicle they believe to be operated by the killer. Shortly afterwards, the owner of the sporting goods store released the whole video. They have this huge parking lot, and the 17 outside cameras are pretty decent. They show what appears to be a silver 2010 to 2012 Nissan Altima coming down the highway in front of the store when it turns its headlights off and pulls into the parking lot. Now, I'll link the the video in my sources so you can check it out for yourself. It's the only car around for miles at this time of the night. We can't see the license plate number because it's fuzzy. We also can't see the driver. Remember, there is a bad thunderstorm going on at the time. It pulls into the plaza and it's just kind of strolling around with its headlights off. Then the headlights turn back on and then they go off again. It would sit for a few minutes and then drive a few feet. It was very strange. The whole video is seven minutes and 52 seconds. Before the car exits the plaza, we see headlights of a tractor trailer coming down the highway. It passes him, and then he turns his right turn signal on before turning out of the plaza and onto Highway 287. He's going in the direction of Creekside Church. I don't know about you, but I've never used my turn signal to turn out of a plaza at 3 a.m. with no other cars on the road for miles. It just seemed like an odd detail to me. We know that below the license plate, there appears to be an oval bumper sticker, but we can't make out what it says, and we also can't read the license plate. The person never got out of the car, at least that we could tell on camera. This is a huge gun shop. Why was he creeping around with his headlights off? I wonder if he was maybe wanting to rob the store and was casing it out. It's kind of dumb to break into a sporting goods store. Picture trying to break into Dick's Sporting Goods at night. There's so many alarms and cameras. There's always the possibility that this could be a couple young people driving around looking for somewhere to park and smoke pot, or maybe someone else altogether who was just being sketchy but doesn't have anything to do with Missy's murder, like a person who pulled off the highway to enter a GPS address. But why turn your headlights off and drive and brake all over this parking lot? I feel like if this person is not our killer, they would likely come forward so they can be cleared. Everyone around this town and neighboring towns is looking for a 2010 to 2012 silver Nissan Altima. What got me, though, is that nobody's like, hey, that's Uncle Billy's car. Remember, the car had a distinctive oval bumper sticker on it. If this is our killer, he left a huge clue by driving around this parking lot. While researching this case, I stumbled upon a YouTuber named Aaron Stoner. He dissected the sporting goods store parking lot surveillance, like painstakingly went through all 20,000 frames of the 7 minute 52 second video and enhanced it. He said it took him two weeks to complete. He believes the first character of the license plate is a handicap symbol, remember the limp. He also believes there is an H and an X in the plate numbers. He also shows us a shot of the driver's face. 
This is through major enhancements, and you would not be able to see it just by watching the video. To me, I see a car, and that's it. But he gives us a glimpse into what he believes is the killer's face by carefully enhancing, enhancing a frame multiple times. I'll link his video as well. It was truly chilling. But police say they just want to talk to this person because they need to either see if he's a link to Missy's murder or completely rule him out so they can stop focusing on this car. Police release a few new clues about the killer. They believe the killer may have used a cell phone to record the murder. I'm not sure why they think this. They obviously know something that we don't. Remember, police don't tell us everything. So for some reason, they believe that this killer used a cell phone and recorded himself attacking Missy. The killer may have sustained injuries during the attack. The killer may have had prior knowledge of the church layout and security system. The killer may have had a personal or professional conflict with Missy. Missy's husband, Brandon, and his dad, Randy, although both were cleared and claim they have rock-solid alibis, they can't escape the court of public opinion that they had something to do with Missy's death, especially with Randy having a similar gait as the person in the video, plus the blood on the shirt, even though it was found to be dog blood, it just doesn't sit right. Brandon says all this speculation really hurt Missy's three daughters, and she would not want that. Their daughters were 15, 13, and 8 at the time of her murder. The girls would receive messages online that read, Your dad killed your mom, and it was really hard to deal with. They had just lost their mom. Now there's all this speculation about their dad and granddad. Brandon told the Dallas Observer, I've always walked a fairly straight line in my whole life. You know, I was a Boy Scout. I've never really strayed outside of what was expected of me socially, or as a son, or a father, or a husband. So to be considered a suspect in your wife's murder through the interrogation and questioning process, it put me in a really dark place. But I'm struggling to find a motive. Nothing was stolen. This wasn't a robbery. She wasn't sexually assaulted. He just broke in, killed Missy, and disappeared. In an interview with NBC, Brandon said that he thought his wife's murder would be solved within seven days or so, but here it is years later and they still don't have any answers. He also truly believes that the killer was a woman. In December 2017, Brandon sent an email to the Crime Stoppers podcast. He said that he was done searching for his wife's killer for the sake of his children. He is just going to focus on Missy's legacy. He says, quote, the children are not terribly fond of apprehending this person. They don't want to revisit those emotions. They have told me this. They see and hear the daily anxiety I've put in to finding this person, and I think they are tired of the mentality this puts on our day-to-day -day life. This behavior has not left Missy the real legacy she deserves, particularly in my children's eyes. From this point forward, the only thing I will discuss is who Missy was, her contributions to my life, the children, this family, and numerous other people that she loved. I thought after Missy's murder, maybe Camp Gladiator would change some of their policies a little bit, maybe have two fitness instructors during class or something along those lines, or get rid of the 5 a.m. classes. But as of 2024, Camp, Camp Gladiator still has 5 a.m. classes. It's 2024 right now, and Missy's murder is still unsolved. If you want to do a deep dive into her case, there's lots of true crime forums and Facebook pages devoted to catching her killer. The biggest thing here is I can't imagine the terror that Missy felt. Like, it was a horror movie. She thought she was alone. She had a gun in her car. If she felt unsafe, she certainly would have gotten her gun. Then she is startled by someone pretending to be a tactical officer. Then he walks towards her and attacks her with a hammer. Rest in peace to Missy Beavers. That's it for this week, and I'll see you all again soon. Take care, and much love to you all. Intro music is Feral Angel Waltz, which is composed by Kevin McLeod, licensed under Creative Commons. All his music can be found on his website, incompetech.com.